Um, uh, great to be here in Lund, so to speak. Um, and as you said, I'm, I'm uh, um, telling you about uh, um, our uh, approaches and uh, recapitulating a little bit the methods, but then this leads to applications and the applications are in bioimaging and in particular tissue. And uh, uh, so I put up here some, some reconstruction, rendered reconstruction from brain tissue, human brain tissue, human lung of a COVID-19 patient. That's Marina's uh, subject then in the following talk and uh, also small animal heart. That's actually an in-house uh, uh, result. So we go from laboratory micro CT all the way to, to uh, um, high coherent synchrotron uh, um, radiation. And it, it's, it's an entire team uh, behind uh, this this talk and in, in, in these uh, efforts, and um, uh, in particular, uh, my present, my past uh, PhD students, and as a staff scientist uh, in our group, Markus Osterhoff uh, is in charge of uh, much of the Genix end station. That's the uh, beam line, or not the beam line, the end station that we operate and that we built for special purposes at the Petra 3 storage ring. Um, as, as, biophysicists, uh, as biophysicists, we are interested in, in um, um, uh, looking at uh, functional units from a structural point of view. And um, for, for a lot of scales in um, biophysics and biology, it's true that, that structure um, uh, makes, enables function. Dynamics is important as well. But uh, it, it all starts with, with figuring out how, how this uh, uh, works in space and, and time. And resolution is important, but it, uh, it can't be overstressed. But uh, from the molecular to the organ, uh, there are many um, uh, scales and um, hidden um, or, or let's say um, uh, intertwined um, uh, hierarchical length scales from molecules to organelles to cells. In, in imaging, the, the um, um, challenge is to move that window uh, that you can cover back and forth to zoom in and to zoom out. And uh, the resolution is as important as, as uh, the field of view. And uh, of course, ideally, it's all three-dimensional because our world is uh, three-dimensional. And that entails a lot of work also in, in optics uh, to cover this. Um, just uh, one example um, in Göttingen here um, in a consortium of uh, uh, and driven by neuroscience, we are interested in, in understanding the uh, connection between two neurons, uh, the synapse. Yeah, that's uh, what the uh, um, transistor is in your uh, CPU. That's uh, in, in, in our, uh, that's the basic um, uh, unit where signal transduction and modulation can happen. Um, and uh, in the human brain, there are, um, tend to the uh, uh, 10 to the uh, 14 such uh, um, such synapses. So uh, ideally, we would like to have this as a computable unit in, in virtual space. So uh, extremely crowded, extremely uh, uh, many constituents. How do we go about it if we do structural biology? Well, we take just constituents and then try to understand something on this protein, on this uh, uh, lipid. It's already uh, quite an endeavor to say, hey, let's have a, a functional uh, uh, synaptic vesicle filled with neurotransmitter. Can, can we look at this? This is also a lot of modeling involved and biochemical data and then integrating, um, integrating structural uh, biology. So uh, also for high resolution methods like X-rays or neutron scattering, you work a lot with model systems. Here we were interested or are interested in the merger between membranes and how can we understand that and find out about curvature. And, and this is uh, in the framework of this talk, is just to remind ourselves that diffraction is a great thing. Classical far field diffraction, you really get, you really get even in aqueous uh, functional units, you get 3D structure on on uh, uh, sub-nanometer uh, angstrom scales. And yes, this is uh, extremely important, but there's a but, you have to have a model system. You have to have uh, 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 quite uh, repetitive uh, structures. You cannot look into something that is very heterogeneous. And even if, if, you, if you go up the level to the organelle, like a synaptic vesicle, yes, you can still treat something by small angle scattering in solution averaging over um, uh, many, many uh, organelles in, in your cuvette, um, but you have to model and you lose a lot of traction because of that averaging. 
So that completely breaks down if you go to a cell or even from a cell to a, a tissue and to an organ. The human brain is, is, is a, a tremendous uh, challenge and people use all kinds of different methods to get beyond the anatomical data, go uh, and to retrieve the cytoarchitecture. And ideally, you can do a lot with cutting and slicing and staining, but ideally you would want to do this on a higher number of uh, tissue samples, for instance, to understand neurodegenerative diseases or to understand connectivity. In, in, in the slicing and classical histology or even EM techniques, it's very difficult to reach isotropic resolution and very difficult to cover large volumes. So here's a uh, tremendous uh, opportunity for, for X-ray imaging. What's the problem then in looking at specific configurations with X-rays? Well, X-ray microscopy is around. Uh, it, uh, it does work, it works with lenses, um, but there are uh, challenges. Loosely put, if you consider that classical light microscopy is limited by diffraction in Abe formula, so it's uh, the uh, numerator, lambda makes a problem, but you know, the, the uh, denominator, the, um, numerical aperture can be quite quite high. For X-rays, you, you should win a factor of uh, three orders of magnitude, but uh, 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 unfortunately, your numerical aperture also goes down. So working with zone plate lenses, there's progress all the time, tremendous progress, but, but still you are far uh, beyond, uh, let's say, lambda for hard X-rays. And there are other inconvenience like several orders or dose issues. So, Classical X-ray microscopy is limited by not diffraction in the sense of this year, but in the sense of this year. You cannot easily, um, you know, focus uh, uh, X-rays, and that 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 carries through all of the optics you want to do. Basically, the challenge is to do optics in the asymptotic limit of every material that we, we would like to make an optical component of being almost like vacuum. Yeah, the index of uh, refraction asymptotically you know, beyond the resonance going to, to, to one for in a simple oscillator model. So, so that's, uh, uh, that's the challenge. And uh, so the idea is around uh, since quite a time now to uh, do X-ray microscopy without lenses, to use diffraction, you know, uh, magnification by the wave equation uh, um, uh, uh, alone. And the smaller the, the structure that you diffract from, the larger the cone, you capture that and you solve a phase problem. And uh, this is a very powerful idea. And roughly speaking, what we do is a variant uh, of this, but uh, most classically, you would have plane wave illumination, you would have an object plane, you would have a detection plane, you, yes, you would work in kinematical approximation and the intensity you measure is the transform of your electron density distribution in the plane. Modulus squared, so this is where the phase problem uh, uh, occurs. And this is now well understood under which conditions there's a way around it. Basically, in short, you have the measurement, the data here on the detector, but you may also have additional constraints, um, such as simply positive the def definiteness of electron density, a compact support, sparsity, any such information can help if you consider it for your problem to be uh, not so invasive, and then using projection algorithms, this is, they're, they're powerful tools, mathematical tools, to solve, uh, you know, what is a, a high-dimensional uh, matrix, uh, if, if you want. So, but, but, but many, many interesting issues, uh, uh, signal theory-wise, and uh, of course, resolution, dose resolution, uh, practical implementation, it's, it's also a challenge. When we started this, we worked with something that is uh, uh, very powerful, and uh, uh, Manuel is here in the audience and others are, are, are using this uh, to, to much benefit. Um, uh, this is uh, the idea of using partial overlap between successive exposures to solve um, the phase problem, yeah, to create more data than unknowns. Uh, you have a test structure, you go around in a spiral or some scan, and look at the diversity of all these uh, um, measured uh, diffraction patterns. That's uh, by now an old idea. It, it has been matured. It's, it's uh, probably the best tool at hand if we go to high resolution. And um, just as a, 
I'm, I'm still uh, nostalgic about it. This was the first time when we tried this just after the algorithm um, had and the basic ideas of, of, of uh, using simultaneous reconstruction of object and probe came out. We tested this and we were already happy about such a reconstruction. Only two years later, that is 10 years back by now, wow, you could even see a test structure as it should be, fair resolution, despite the fact that the beam, the probe, is completely aberrated and has horizontally and vertically different uh, focal widths. So uh, uh, you have these, um, uh, these, these aberrations, and yes, you could also use this for biological imaging and for tomography. There is an issue, and this is why we did not continue along that route. And this is for the simple reason that we were in most problems that we were considering with our collaborators, interested in very extended samples uh, in tissues and uh, something that was not uh, compact enough or small enough to, to really do the uh, lateral rastering and then the, uh, the uh, 3D tomography, even though this can also be scaled up. So let's start at the opposite end. Let's go to the hospital and take a look at uh, radiography, classical absorption-based radiography. You get almost a, um, you know, a, a, a projection image uh, as if it was a geometric optics with um, um, a shadow mechanism that is uh, given by uh, Lambert's law, essential, uh, simple linear absorption. And then the absorption coefficient varies with composition and that gives you ability to see uh, in particular mineralized tissue. But for soft tissue, it's challenging. This is a small animal cochlea, but we start to see at this, um, in this uh, projection recorded at a liquid jet source with a six micron spot size at, at a distance where you have some partial coherence, you start to see the edge enhancement and that the fact that the X-rays are actually waves. So you can beyond, you can go beyond this and you can record um, a, um, a tomographic scan and then uh, hope for more visibility for soft tissues. So what follows then is full field tomography. And in fact, full field is really this macroscopic benefit of covering, in this case, the chest of a small patient, that's a mouse. And here's the signal, the variation of the attenuation curve. And this is just uh, a you know, recapitulation for, for, for those of you who haven't um, worked much with uh, uh, tomography. You record, or let's say you, 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 you complete your sinogram for each of the lines in the simplest case and uh, see how these, these, these bones, so, so to speak, move around while, while you turn the specimen. And uh, using filters and back uh, uh, projection in the simplest case, better to do it um, iteratively and more sophisticated, but uh, often this is sufficient and it's also fast. Um, you can uh, reconstruct this 3D, uh, 2D slice and a similarity, a similarity all parallel slices. And yes, you see bones and also soft tissue. You do see uh, the lung tissue here. And uh, this, is, um, this is not yet exploiting really face contrast. But now we want to go better and we want, going to, want to zoom in and want to see the small soft the tissues as, as good as we can for the small animal. So here we exploit the fact that the index of refraction is complex valued. We have attenuation, of course, but also phase shift. And uh, by self-interference of the beam after it leaves, uh, after it penetrates the object, um, it, it may be attenuated, it may be phase shifted. So then these, uh, this, this wave interferes with itself and um, phase information is converted to measurable intensity in the detection plane. Detector has to be a little bit uh, far um, spaced. Uh, you know, there has to be room for propagation of the wave field and there has to be partial coherence uh, sufficiently high. But if you have this, then the fact that uh, delta for um, small uh, Z uh, materials, uh, elements, is um, orders of magnitude higher than beta, gives you an advantage. So, so that's, that's, that's some, that very good. The image formation of phase contrast is, is, is well understood. And it's a nice chapter of you know, an optics course. You start with fresnel kirchhoff integrals. You have an object, uh, a variation in absorption or phase, and then the whole thing evolves. 
And it's also very nice to see and to understand how you can, dis can solve this, how you can simulate this on a discretized grid by fast Fourier transform and, and exploiting the different ways that you can write this, these propagation and very easily and very quickly, uh, if you have this in a lecture uh, or in an exercise, the student can calculate um, how absorption and phase um, uh, varies significantly, I mean, systematically with the Fresnel number. Yeah, this can be uh, all the way to the holographic regime. And the holographic regime at smallest Fresnel number F is, is important because here your sensitivity to, to small contrast is, is highest. Let's look at it more quantitatively. We take a, in this case, real 3D phantom. That's, uh, that's nice. We have a plane wave illumination. We take um, indices uh, that would match, uh, let's say, a protein at, at, at a relevant uh, photon energy. And then you can see what this would look like without noise or with noise. This is without noise, but um, as a function of uh, F. So credit to Dennis Gabor, who, who uh, gave us uh, inline holography. At his time, going back was really hard. You took the analog film as a second sample and then let the wave travel backwards. But in that case, your intensity acts as a phase and your, your amplitude is, is disregarded. And, and this gives simply not a very good reconstruction. Yeah, so a challenge is really the inverse problem. How do you go from the measured hologram to the sharp exit, uh, exit wave? And the holographic reconstruction is problematic. If, you, uh, if your object is optically thin, you can you have an explicit approximation for the propagation. You can express it in Fourier space of the wave uh, in, in lateral coordinates. In other words, the Fourier transform of the hologram can be described as the Fourier transform of the exit wave times a multiplicative oscillatory filter. So image reconstruction is a structured um, filter, uh, a regularized filter. And this is uh, what is known as the contrast transfer function. And that works fairly well, but not good enough for many samples um, and requirements. And then we have iterative reconstruction where as in CDI, but now just with a different propagator, we cycle between the object and the detector um, and we just apply our measurements and maybe additional constraints or simply two measurements in two planes and no additional constraints. Um, everybody puts in what uh, she or he has, yeah, in, in that sense, works beautifully, is a bit uh, uh, more involved computationally, but gives you really very good, very good uh, uh, quality. So image reconstruction for a long time in this near field regime has really been focused on one step um, schemes built um, uh, uh, based on transport of intensity equation, for instance, uh, the famous Paganin approach, uh, or, and that was already, so to speak, high end, the CTF based approach. If you let go this requirement of having a one step operation, um, you can really go uh, base, you can really leave linearization. And uh, in our view, this is important. Long story back, we come back to the mouse. Uh, we have the uh, absorption contrast image, but now we focus in and we measure this with a high resolution detector so that the coherence length is larger than a pixel. And here we see phase effects and we get a chance to see the alveoli, the tiny air sacs in lung, that's good. But if we don't uh, do uh, uh, any phase retrieval uh, step, our reconstruction, our reconstructed slice looks still quite noisy and we cannot segment. If we uh, adapt, at least if we take, uh, make a little bit of effort of phase retrieval, we can now distinguish these components quite well. So, so that's, uh, that's the benefit. Even if uh, what I have telling you was really the idealized Phase retrieval in the lab, of course, this is not. I mean, it's uh, it's a broad spectrum. It's a, a, a large source, so so just barely enough partial coherence, and there are inversion schemes which are optimized for that too. So that that then gives us some recreation. We can look at something that we have reconstructed. Uh, it's a, a movie that uh, um, uh, that Martin Krenkel in the group uh, compiled from then 
from that data. And because we will hear more about lung later in Marina's talk, it's a pleasure to play it. And also to remember that laboratory techniques in the meantime are quite powerful. And in within a field of interest here uh, in the lung, where we used the high resolution detector, the higher resolution fiber coupled detector, we now reconstruct really the uh, alveoli walls in the soft uh, tissue and can do statistical analysis and uh, on this, despite the fact that it's an entire mouse. Yeah, so uh, no, uh, definitely uh, the entire small animal. Now, what can't we do? What, where does the lab not allow us to go uh, a little bit further. This here is again lung tissue, again murin from mouse, but here we want to see cells in 3D. Um, in green we have uh, macrophages, and again we have a zoom in, in the center. We can zoom in at different magnifications, but this is something where we need, uh, if, we, if we leave this, you know, um, uh, just barely, I must say, uh, the uh, resolution that we can achieve with uh, uh, best detectors, microscope-based detectors. Now we have to really um, magnify and we need very small spot, source spots and we need high coherence and we go to the synchrotron. Another example, three examples where you see this line between um, laboratory and synchrotron. And I must say the phase contrast tomographies when, when third generation synchrotron sources came up in the 90s, that quality is, is, is we, we now got much better quality in, with laboratory instruments than we had at the time with synchrotron radiation. Yeah, and, and the, uh, this uh, excellent source, the, the liquid jet technology pioneered by Hans Herz and his group has, has played an important role in this. So um, just to have the power density that is required, it, allowed us quite some time back now to, to, to use this for an actual important uh, problem and application development of optogenetical implants with, the, um, uh, with Tobias Moser and his group here in Göttingen. And the challenge was to see nerve fibers and tissues and membranes within the bony you know, environment of the cochlea. And if you understand your resolution and your instrument, you can really go from something, okay, I'm gonna see soft tissue to something, yes, now I see it sharp. And now I can, with this added quality, I can really segment automatically a uh, gray value base or, or whatever you, you use. In addition, it all scales with the image quality. And uh, we were happy that that worked. But how about really, taking the same cochlea, similar cochlea, but now seeing every single cell. You know, this is again something where you would need synchrotron radiation. This is a result um, that we got for parallel beam uh, illumination, not even any magnification, 650 nanometer voxel size, but here now you can really zoom in to the functional interesting uh, parts of the cochlea, the organ of corti and these are neurons that are important in the filtering of the auditory signal, so-called spiral neural ganglions. And from such data here, um, you can uh, segment each and every neuron and here you, they are color coded uh, according to size. You can, you can uh, once you have this 3D data, you can compute sphericities and sizes and densities and neighborhood information. So there's a lot, despite the fact that the resolution is not you know, that high, but field of view is gigantic. It's functional uh, in a sense that, that you don't cut to something that you cannot interpret. You can see the tonotomic uh, map and um, that was, that's from, from a publication that came out uh, yesterday and we're, we're quite happy with uh, this, uh, this quality. But uh, in the lab, uh, you can do a third, a third example, um, human tissue, that the previous was, was gerbil, small animal models for that research project. But here's a sample from neuropathology. So it's a biopsy punch, it's human hippocampus um, embedded in paraffin, that's the standard that they uh, do in each uh, pathology department. And it's a, a millimeter cross-section. And here the uh, uh, pathologists and the, um, the medical doctors are interested in the process of uh, plaque formation in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, very, uh, very clearly you can, you can see the overall um, uh, tissue a cytoarchitecture already with the liquid metal jet um, uh, recording. 
And then uh, that allows us uh, to see vessels and calcified vessels and the, uh, the uh, granule um, cell band of the dentus uh, gyratus. And uh, maybe again, you can hear some more on this in, in uh, Marina's talk. So that's possible with a lab source. But if, it, if, it, if you wanted to then go uh, after small dendrites and connections and maybe a synapses at some point, that needs synchrotron radiation. That's a reconstruction from synchrotron radiation, um, which allows you, uh, in this case, these are quite large cells in human cerebellum, uh, so-called Purkinje cells. But uh, you have the uh, cellular resolution and uh, you see uh, nuclei and you see substructures and dendrites and, and axons. So, so that's, that's uh, more geared towards also neuroscience. How do we do this? That's now the next uh, topic. That was the motivation. We need some magnification here. We need magnification and resolution. First of all, uh, when we talk about image propagation and uh, reconstruction, whether it's parallel beam or ideal point beam, that's the same thing. There's a simple variable transform and the, um, let's say, um, wave optics preserves geometric magnification as you may have guessed, but the, the propagation distance has to be scaled. So that's good. You read about this in Paganin's book, uh, Perfectly Treated. Um, how do we do it ex experimentally? We have to focus. And if we can't focus uh, uh, well enough, uh, and that does not only relate to the spot size, but also the coherence or the stability. Yeah, if that jitters because your monochromator moves, or um, if that has uh, a wave front that is not clean, one thing that helps that we uh, uh, found was, was helpful is to filter this by, by use of an X-ray optical guide, uh, uh, um, wave guide. So we use guided wave optics to select certain modes and to use the exit as a virtual point source. That offers really a benefit. So I'm now talking about uh, waveguide optics for high resolution holography. How does that work? It's a special approach. There are different, uh, different uh, approaches. It's not the only way to, to go to the uh, nanoscale with holotomography, as, uh, as you know. Um, but it has some, uh, some pros and definitely also some, some cons. Typically, we lose photons. In our instrument, uh, we focus to 200 or 300 nanometers. Uh, so we overexpose the waveguide channel. And then um, we work with 10 to the 9 photons per second, roughly. And the sample is in the defocus and is then, you know, you, we record the projected um, hologram. This is a reconstruction of the intensity superimposed with the uh, um, waveguide channel. This is a 100 nanometer uh, scale bar. And uh, this is where we do this. We have an instrument where the sample and the waveguide is in air. This has also pros and cons for complex sample environments, it's a challenge, but we can also run wet samples, like also wet neural tissues in buffer or methanol. Everything is installed here at the P10 beamline of Petra 3 of that storage ring. And uh, yes, this is the way we work. We are, we are proud of this. We uh, like to take photos of this configuration and that configuration. A while ago, we also temporarily installed a STED microscope that we have here in Göttingen, but designed so, so we can take it to, to Hamburg and side by side take X-ray and, and optical recordings of cells. So, so that, that, that works and, and, and is, uh, is, is promising. But now let's focus on the, the waveguide optics. You can couple in a beam from a side, uh, from the side through a thin uh, cladding. Um, here we use front coupling. We, we really focus on the entrance and then um, we have formation of modes. We can simulate this with uh, finite uh, differences and um, study uh, precisely what uh, uh, length and what lateral diameters we want. Uh, these are the simple schemes. We can, we can test them against analytical schemes. And by now we even have time propagation. We can even could even see for, for short a femtosecond or attosecond pulses how, how modes propagate differently uh, in, in time. And uh, that, that can also be done. For the waveguides, we use them as simple channels for imaging, but we could do more complex uh, geometries. We can 
think of splitters. Uh, we could also start to fabricate splitters. We can curve channels. We could delay channels. We could design structured uh, illuminations uh, uh, in that sense. For instance, to um, have an additional benefit from um, off-axis holography encoding also absolute phase shift or from tilting the beam towards high angles and having heterodyne phasing at high numerical aperture. These things can be done and experimentally we showed that we can have um, a wave guide exit at uh, something like uh, 20 degrees. If you simulate it, really even a circle would be possible with 30% uh, transmission. Uh, an extreme whispering uh, gallery mode. Um, then in, 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 in that case, uh, the first uh, millimeter of, of, of you know, propagation along the path would look like this, the last like this for straight and for curved, the mode is a little bit you know, pressed, it's, it's like in the car, by centrifugal force against the outer cladding, yeah, so to speak. That, that's uh, that's that's uh, uh, nice uh, optics of curved uh, waveguides and uh, maybe there's some interesting applications um, to come up with uh, uh, with the free electron lasers. But here it's all about filtering. Filtering means that, okay, we have different modes of the source, uh, but it could also be a mirror or a monochromator. So your ideal focus that you simulate is, is not really what you have. You would have be looking at something like this. And this filtering means that different input modes, you know, you lose photons, but in the end, this becomes much more stable. Uh, so we, we, we studied uh, analytically and numerically this propagation uh, of coherence, and uh, it looked uh, attractive to us. We uh, spent uh, quite some effort to do the uh, nanostructuring and uh, to build waveguides from layered sequences and then crossing to such um, planar waveguides or from lithography. Can be done and uh, this is then the exit uh, wave uh, intensity that we record on a detector five meters away um, compared to uh, the um, mirror of course we may not have the best mirror uh, in, in in town so to speak uh, with uh, uh, more uh, height errors but uh, um, if you go to an x-ray uh, 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 beam line, ask for the probe. Let's always have the probe because you can divide out, but you will always be limited also in, 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 in the probe. And it's this quality that then really gives us very decent, very ideal holograms that have fringes all the way out to the uh, detector. And that's just a simple uh, example, a test structure comparing the holographic reconstruction with twin image problems and the uh, CTF uh, reconstruction that you know makes some assumptions which are well warranted here actually the, the uh, it, it is a weak object but the iterative reconstruction with an automatic uh, support uh, uh, finding a step gives you really the best uh, uh, um, the better um, uh, reconstruction. Now, when we used that for imaging, uh, we uh, found uh, that we could get uh, uh, reconstructions at surprisingly low um, dose compared to our own, let's say, pleurographic uh, uh, tomography uh, reconstructions. But uh, if you study that problem, there shouldn't be such a difference. So it may probably be more in the experimental uh, determination. Um, if you are in a defocused position, um, it's it is, it's in a sense, it helps not to overly waste photons that, that you would have in the focus. I mean, in the focus, you should be able to move faster uh, and, 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 and scan, um, but uh, you have to uh, critically interrogate your focusing optics also in view of having too many modes, maybe modes that don't contribute. So for waveguides, you always come from, from, from lower uh, uh, fluence or flux density, and you have all the intermediate steps. Um, it's uh, well, while in, in far field CDI and photography, it's sometimes you have the feeling if it works, you get high resolution, but you also have high dose. Um, it's how, how continuous can you, can you go up and down? That, that's, that's still an open, open question. Here, it worked beautifully to reconstruct bacterial cells or 
eukaryotic larger cells, uh, macrophages, and we can compare different reconstruction uh, techniques. So yes, and, and, and this is an advantage you still can, you can put the waveguide in and take a defocus image, but you can also go to the focus and um, do a raster scan and look at the far field uh, diffraction for purpose of cartography or scanning socks or fluorescence. You can do this on the same specimen. Those re resolution uh, relationships uh, are issues that we studied uh, numerically. And uh, for, for CDI, we found a benefit for holography, but then uh, the group of Chris Jacobson compared tohography and holography and, and found equal dose in, in practice, in, in, in a numerical model. So that, that is, of course, these are important issues. But what we, uh, uh, what we then do is, is, and what really facilitates, uh, let's say, life is to have this full field for a tomographic reconstruction. This is a, a, a cell which is quite uh, large. It's a marine uh, cardiomyocyte. And um, uh, so with uh, rather uh, quickly, uh, with um, I'm not sure how many uh, angles we used in that case, uh, that you know, single cell can be, can be reconstructed and it can be analyzed, uh, mitochondria and, and so forth. But a single cell, we also must keep in mind that a single cell is really something that can be looked at with so many other powerful techniques. Where X-rays are really unique is a single cell in the entity of the entire organ. And that's then really the direction that we would like to move or that we are moving right now. And this is also where many uh, uh, questions uh, arise. So you saw the single heart cell, but how about, this is human tissue, um, how about uh, cardiomyocytes in, um, uh, in functional heart tissue, like from a biopsy or an autopsy? Um, here we were interested in, in the vasculature and again in changes and pathologies of COVID-19, which is subject of the next talk by Marina. So, okay, uh, how do we go from here? Uh, of course, the three-dimensionality is important, the field of view is important, but um, the other end, the high resolution is also important. And it bothered us that uh, typically we hit the wall uh, just uh, below uh, 50 or 30 nanometers with the standard approach. So here's a sign, I guess this is uh, um, also showing, uh, referring to the, uh, oh, uh, a few more minutes. So that's fine. So how do we, how can we, how can we use the benefits of uh, holography at the same time um, uh, increase our resolution? Well, what we uh, did most recently, we, we recorded with the waveguide beam, but uh, we go uh, to a pixel detector and we don't divide by the empty beam. We take the data as it is and we can re reconstruct both from the uh, holographic signal and the uh, diffracted signal. And this is, is really taking up the theme of so-called keyhole uh, CDI, but with uh, all the benefit of everything that happened in between, in particular, geographic probe reconstruction. And it's uh, this scheme um, that some of you may know, um, uh, exploiting a very particular um, optics, namely uh, in the plane, in the waveguide exit plane, where the probe is highly compact, we can use this. And um, uh, then we have uh, maximum curvature in the object, not maximum, but high curvature in the ob uh, object plane and high compactness in, in the source plane. And this is, is a, 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 an excellent match. And here goes, uh, here goes really uh, my presentation, um, but I have to finish it. Um, let me see. No, I, can, I can't move anymore. Now, Dina, did, did you do this to cut me, uh, to cut me, uh, let me, let me give it. No, I promise I didn't. Uh, you didn't, you, you didn't let me uh, try it once more um, that I can, uh, I have to go out of the, and, and, and then I go in again. So that uh, gives you maybe a break. Um, and then I have to start anew.
and here we are. So there's, we, we use more or less the predetermined uh, uh, probe as a, as a um, constraint. And we use uh, simply uh, um, the Fourier propagator, but putting in you know, the very specific face front that we have in the object, which is a plane, which is very, very, uh, very, very clean. In this case, we reach uh, 11 nanometer resolution at a field of view in a single shot that is much higher than what you would get from the sampling constraint of the detector of your pixel size, 27, uh, 75 micron for the Eiger, simply because the low spatial frequencies are encoded in the uh, holographic signal. So that is, 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 is very good. Uh, we get very good uh, uh, single acquisition data. It also works for, for cells. And we're trying to put this to use now for, for tissues. And uh, for this end at Petra 4, we want to build an optimized uh, instrument. We still go for wavefront filtering to really emancipate ourselves from everything that happens upstream and to have this very compact plane where we can say, if we can use a very powerful constraint, no stray radiation, no orders, just uh, uh, you know, um, 50 nanometer um, uh, support constraint or something else. And we will use uh, pi uh, pixel detectors, but now at, uh, we go to 25 meters uh, to, to really uh, uh, use uh, pixel detection and uh, to have a reasonable uh, field of view, yeah? because we cannot always go too, too close to the waveguide. So that's all a long story sh stored. We must make, we are pressed by our own competition. If we go to the lab, also in the lab here, this is work by Marina. You can see beautifully biopsy uh, reconstruction, single cells. So uh, the synchrotron has, has to move all, also forward and, and then we can cover all length scales and open up the window of what we are seeing. So that is here uh, the team. I showed you example reconstruction work by Mareike Tepevin, who is now working uh, with uh, Xilon uh, company tomography. She's a tomography specialist in industry. Marius Reichert, still in the lab as a senior PhD student. And so is uh, Marina Eckermann and um, um, many others that are involved in our collaborators um, in Hamburg and, and here uh, in the uh, University uh, Clinic in particular. Um, thanks, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tim, for this overview. Uh, really dense of information. So the session is open for questions and comments. We have already one, Vincent fabre nicolas He asked for the keyhole holotomography. Are you still using a near field propagator? That, that's an excellent uh, question. Actually, we, we, we don't because typically uh, the Eiger is five meters away and our sample is, let's say, 10 millimeters away from the source. And um, uh, so, yes, you could convert to an equivalent parallel beam scheme, take the curvature of the input beam uh, away. But if we, if, we, uh, um, if we adjust our sampling, we can beautifully do it with the uh, Fourier transform. So we take, we take the detector uh, data, we do an inverse Fourier transform, we go to the plane of where the sample is, and then we use uh, uh, a phase and amplitude of the probe as a constraint, and it works. It works really uh, beautifully. So you use a far field propagator? And yeah, yeah, yes, 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 it, yes. It's a far field propagator, but we can show in, in simulation that the fact that we have a, a curved, a highly curved um, wavefront is, is, is really a tremendous benefit. Yeah, it, it's a tremendous benefit because our field of view, in, if it was in CDI, we could not, it would be not properly sampled. If we, we could not, uh, uh, you know, if we, if we take the oversampling criterion to, to five meters and um, uh, 75 microns, that would give us a field of view. Uh, I, I forgot what it is. If it was uh, three microns, I think that was for the Eiger, so it was a little bit more, uh, larger. But we have a factor of two at least that we can, uh, that we can face stably with this uh, uh, curved um, uh, illumination. And uh, we, we, we think about it and we talk about it and speculate about it, why this is the case. So one interesting fact is that, you know, the far field uh, has this Friedel symmetry, yeah? but in the uh, holo uh, in the holographic cone, this is not true. So um, you actually get less. So you, you also get a for for quite a number of pixels, you get more information because you don't have this. Uh, uh, you know, for the 
pure fast, if I, uh, for the pure far field case, every second pixel is you know redundant with the with a different one. And um, yes, uh, that's uh, uh, that's that's a scheme I think that is very promising. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I've seen before lots of hands raising, and then for some reason they disappear. But Manuel is there. Please, Manuel. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Tim, for the great talk. It's very good to see what you've been up to. Uh, what one question I had was uh, if you have tried with uh, you showed this this example that is inspired on this idea of the keyhole, etc. Have you tried to to tr to measure with a few different positions similar to what they do for the near field typography in in ESRF at the Club in Saint Pierre? We, 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 we didn't explore that much. I mean, we, we, um, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very good uh, direction. I mean, uh, typically you do want to enlarge the field of view laterally anyhow. So why don't you take a little bit uh, of data there? The same for the tomographic scan. Again, you can have a very uh, beneficial aspects of, you know, two uh, uh, projections uh, not being completely independent for the uh, low spatial frequencies. So far, we really did the bare minimum. We um, compared uh, reconstructions that just have one empty beam uh, that also works nice, or take the sample and do a small geographic pre-scan just to reconstruct the probe. And then you do single acquisitions yeah, for all rotations or so. So, so we played a little bit with this, but uh, uh, not, not much, much more. But um, um, yeah, I think it, it's really interesting. It's interesting also because you are using, you end up using pixel detectors. Yeah, with respect to the holographic comparison, this is very interesting. Uh, we, could, we can't really use the same um, detector for standard holography, dividing by the empty beam, because our pixel size is too large. Yeah, it's, it's really, mm -hmm. it's, uh, from, from the holographic point of view, it's it's really even if you don't not interested in the super resolution, I say yeah, I'm not really uh, I'm, I'm happy with the previous resolution. You 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 realize that with the fiber coupled CCD or with the uh, a single, uh, uh, microscope, you have small pixels, um, but yep. uh, you need the small pixels, and the, the 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 pixel detector doesn't do do it. But if you if you if you beat this because you have an added uh, smaller sampling in the object plane by the high angle, that works. So that, that's also yeah. a, a good advantage. And if I can follow up quickly, since I don't see I'm taking yeah. too much time yeah. from others, let's put. Um, I was now thinking that you were mentioning it. I mean, have you done, if you, if you do tomography with the waveguide by doing this uh, holographic that you remove the probe from the influence of the objects, etc., have you tried to do it in instead of doing every projection in 2D, separate the probe from the object and then do tomography, have you tried to do it like uh, as a one problem in 3D? Yeah, I think yes, yes, that, that, is, that, yeah. That, that is much better. That is much better for a number of reasons. We, we, we uh, worked uh, on this already a while ago and we called this IRP, uh, iterative reprojection uh, algorithm. Uh, I mean, there are many ways to do it and there are many works, but it, it, it really is, is, is fantastic. It's computationally more uh, expensive, but um, in particular in propagation uh, imaging, the low spatial frequencies are poorly yeah. encoded. And okay. this is where you have all, you know, Fourier slice theorem, all this redundance of very close intersecting yeah. lines. So it stabilizes uh, tremendously. And of course, you can use much better constraints in 3D uh, like uh, on beta delta, then you can do from a projection. So it's only and only uh, limited by um, you know how, how how good you are in implementing this on a CPU. We mm -hmm. we started to do this, or we did we we, we published some, something in in uh, 2014 on this. First author is uh, Eike Ruland, and then we decided, yeah, yeah yeah we can do it for 500 times 500 pixels, but it's not sufficient. We should look at it again and want to do it serious uh, data science approach, and I think it would would fly. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, so, Tim. I was interested in in your comparison between synchrotron sources and laboratory sources. Yeah. I think it's very, 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 very good point. So um, I understand that the main reason to go to synchrotron is the resolution that you can achieve. 
Yeah, also quantitative contrast, of course, or, or wet specimen. Like if we if if the the if we um, if you have a tissue in 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 water, not in ethanol, but in water, and not in paraffin or resin, and not stained and metallized, metallized, then uh, even if you uh, relax the resolution and you ask for a resolution that is possible in the lab, you still won't get good results uh, in 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 the lab. So in in, in that case, it's uh, your your synchrotron will be the only opportunity. But um, it's it's shifting all the way, and there's there's contrast. Luckily for compact, uh, uh, for compact uh, small instruments, that is also substantial. They detect uh, the sources, the control, and that, that's very good. So on both worlds, we have we have a lot of progress. Okay, and in terms of optics, your choice it's, of yeah, say that again. Uh, were you continuing or? Uh, 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 no, no, I'm, I'm done, sorry. Yeah. So uh, in terms of optics, your choice for the waveguides is really about the quality of the vignette. Yeah, yeah. It's all yeah. about the, wall, the quality yeah. and also the yeah. size. It's, it's, our work is, is very driven by the fact that we have unstained uh, tissue. And um, so the contrast is very low and it's very, of course, uh, it's biological tissue and you don't want um, any damage. So we, we ask for an imaging scheme that goes with extended samples that covers low contrast uh, at moderate resolution, say, and uh, that uh, works at uh, um, a, a kilo gray. Yeah, for, for uh, so, so that, that's, this is, and in, in for that, uh, for, for that parameter window, it's it's uh, it's a, a quite a powerful approach, and then also for samples that are really uh, um, hydrated, yeah, which are difficult in to bring in uh, into the vacuum. Of course, if you have a cryo workflow, that's again different. But large tissues you cannot easily uh, uh, vitrify also by cryogenic uh, techniques. Okay, um, I have a question in the chat. Yes. Uh, Tune Zhu says, do you think it is possible to do holography with nanotube or is yeah. not really? Better? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we do face retrieval recordings with the nanotube. Uh, the last image that I showed you from Marina's uh, publication uh, two years ago, that was uh, using uh, um, a reconstruction, a face retrieval reconstruction. And then you can also get, uh, you know, let's say 300 nan nanometer voxel sizes. And you see something that, that so we, didn't, we typically don't call it holography because the Fresnel number is not small enough. It's just edge enhancement. And, and the coherence is also um, not rigorous enough to say, oh, this is really how we, you know, the holographic forward problem. So, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's still, um, it can still, you can take compromises and you can still see, let's say, the enhanced density of a, of a cell nucleus with respect to uh, uh, its environment. So um, to be more holographic, uh, maybe if you um, have a detector that singles out just uh, a smaller bandwidth and uh, like uh, we, we're trying uh, to work with the Mönch detector now. Um, and um, yes, maybe we're not so far away from more holographic signals also in the lab. But yeah, it's, it's still, uh, still, still uh, fundamentally limited, I would say. Okay. So are there any other questions for our team for this first part of the, the micro nano symposium? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would just leave uh, the field to Marina. Tim, thanks so much, and uh, we will be here. So uh, yeah, Dina, don't you serve don't you see, uh, don't you serve coffee in between? Yes, uh, it's going to arrive like in a couple yeah, of it's, minutes. It's very, very good. <laughs> so I don't know. Is, is, does anyone want a couple of minutes leg stretch, or can we just continue? Nobody raises their hands, so I think it's okay. <laughs> Uh, Marina. Yeah, I just realized that my laptop made an update, so I need to okay. give the permission that I can share the screen. Somehow. Uh, let me see. If... Sorry. No, no, I need to do this with my laptop. Somehow. I see. Okay. Um, then there is a then there is a good minute and a half for for leg stretch for everyone. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. 
Ah, oh, that's too bad. Tim, there's actually a question for this minute. Yeah, um, that's, that's okay. That's good. Um, did you did you think about using like some because you men mentioned the money using some kind of subpixel registration? If you have an, this kind of detectors that you that you could break down your pixel size a bit more. Yeah, yeah. In with the with the Mönch we got from Anna Vergamasti, we got a, a prototype, and uh, that worked uh, fairly well. It was a bit of uh, programming, uh, but uh, I think it's very promising. It it, it we had to um, uh, uh, attenuate the incoming beam though a little bit, yeah, because it, it can only work at at low. Uh, flux conditions, but uh, I mean, any progress in that field, of course, will be highly uh, in, um, appreciated. To, to which kind of virtual pixel size did you get, or to which accuracy of your charge cloud determination? I, mean, I, I, I think it was a factor five with respect to the physical pixel size of 25 microns. So, so that was already uh, quite good. Wow, that's great. Cool, thank you. Tim, I had another. Oh, sorry, yeah, I'm just, I just want to say I'm sorry for the delay. No, it's okay. <laughs> just let me know when you're ready mm -hmm. and you first. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was wondering about soft X rays. Mm -hmm. I mean, all mm -hmm. the work you've shown is with, is with hard X rays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. what can be you know, gained using soft X rays in, in this field? I think for single cell um, uh, coherent diffractive imaging, yeah, uh, holography or tachography, uh, there would be uh, uh, quite some interest. Yeah, I mean, if we if we started uh, to think about eight kV and then consider the phase shift of an organelle and the phase, uh, I mean, of course, in a in a tissue and hydrated larger environment, you don't have a choice. But uh, ideally, I think uh, in the tender uh, regime. If you would had the right detectors and high numerical aperture on the geometry, you would probably get a very good uh, um, sensitive uh, um, uh, instrument for 3D uh, reconstructions. I mean, there's, there's of course the classical water window X-ray microscopy that is uh, quite mature and also uh, I think you, you see the, the, uh, the, the benefits. Um, but then I think uh, three, four, uh, five kV ish, two to four kV tender that has been around. People talk about it, but I don't see a single instrument that can serve it. And it could be, it could be, it could be of interest. I see. Okay.